I want to begin by thanking Brother Mark Bernhardt for taking my place last week as I, uh, Teresa and I were out of town. We appreciate him and his ability that he was able to preach the word. I was able to join in as well and to be able to hear his lessons. And he did an excellent job and we appreciate him. We're continuing our One Another series, a One Another Church. And today we're considering this word forbearance. We're told there in Ephesians 4 and verse 2 to forbear one another. One of the great challenges that we have in life is learning to cope with those things that are different. Right? I mean, we struggle trying to identify or to relate to that which we do not understand. They keep saying that we have to accept the new normal when it comes to living our lives, whatever that new normal is, right? And especially that's true in our relationship with people, isn't it? Isn't it true that when you get on an airplane that you're a little bit uncomfortable with people who get on that plane with some Muslim garb, right? I mean, you can't help but to think that way because of what happened back on September 11, 2001, even though they probably weren't even wearing that type of clothing at the time they did what they did. But all of us can relate to that. When people are somewhat different from us, that makes us a little bit scared. Evidently, ancient Israel had struggled with that as well because over and over God had warned Israel through Moses. He said, you be mindful of the stranger and make sure that you treat them, the the stranger right, because you need to remember at one time you were strangers in a foreign land. So be careful how you treat the stranger. But what about our interactions with other people in the church? in the body of Christ. I I find the church so very interesting because God through the gospel calls us, calls people from various backgrounds, different ways of life, you know, different personalities. And he brings them all together in this one entity, right? All together in this one place called the church. And he says, learn to love each other. Learn to love each other, right? And learn to get along, even though we are very, very different in so many ways. And because of these differences, however, we can oftentimes get irritated with each other or frustrated with one another. It causes arguments to ensue and disruption at times. Even churches have divided over some of those petty differences that might not even been doctrinal at all, you know. And so we're dealing with people, aren't we? We're dealing with people and the feelings of people and differences in people. How do you deal with that? Well, we're not talking about anything doctrinal at this point, but we know to be committed to sound doctrine above all, don't we? We want to be able to hear sound doctrine being taught from this pulpit. We don't want no other doctrine being taught at all. But the differences in people with different opinions, that's where we get into trouble, isn't it, sometimes? And this is where Paul takes us right here in Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to concentrate on this particular passage this morning, beginning in verse 1. Let's read it again. He says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Right? With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, Paul is one. If you examine his writings, or was very eager to maintain the very bond of peace, if you will. And he says, we can have that peace. We can have it in the church as the congregations of the Lord. If only we would learn forbearance forbearing is related to forgiveness but we're not going to concentrate too much on forgiveness today because next week we're going to look at forgive one another 
But yes, forbearance is related to that. You see, usually when we think about forbearance, we're talking about how to deal with petty issues that seem to arise. And if they haven't, they will just wait on, right? Sometimes somebody could have offended us over something petty, and that person might not even known they had done that. Through, therefore, forbearance comes into play. Controlling oneself when a person feels that he's being provoked. He doesn't respond agitated or frustrated because he's learned to be forbearing of others. That's why in the book of Divine Wisdom, Proverbs 17, 9, we read that he that covereth a transgression seeketh love. And then two chapters later, Proverbs 19, 11, he says that the discretion of a man deferreth his anger and it is his glory that pass over a transgression. The forbearing person will just let some things go. Now, I know that that's not always easy. I understand that. But the person who is filled with forbearance says it's not worth being offended every time. Something happens to me that seems like an offense. I can just let some things go. And of course, we always think of that song from Frozen, Let It Go, right? We just need to let some of those things go, right? Now, the beauty of the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, and of course, we're going to partake of that just right after the sermon this morning. But I think is, this is the idea. It's a reminder to us not only of our Lord's death, but of something else. It reminds us of what we share in common together. You see, in just a few moments, I personally will be partaking of the Lord's Supper as a memorial to the death of Jesus. But not only will I be partaking of it, but you will also be partaking of, and that's something that we have in common together. We have something in common. Christ died for every one of us, each one of us. We gather here today to honor him in this memorial feast, so thankful that he died and took our place on that cross, but that he died for us. And so we have that in common once every week that is worth thinking about together. Forbearance. Anika Maihai, or Aniki Mai. My e. It is to put up with. To put up with. The New American Standard Bible says, showing tolerance for one another. Forbearance. But it's not just putting up with. It's a little more intense than that. That's what we need to understand. It is endurance. Very closely akin to our word patience. Listen to the Apostle Paul in First. Corinthians chapter 4 as he talks about some of his his, of his own trials right of his own trials but notice how he faces those difficulties and and see if you can hear in his words the spirit of forbearance he says in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 4 he says even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. Is that a forbearing person? Yes, indeed it is. Paul not only putting up with some things placed upon him by by his brethren on his shoulders, but he endured them as well. Paul would be one who would undergo punishment, but he would take it very quietly, wouldn't he? In that regard, we find that he's very much like our Lord when it comes to forbearance. For your own personal study this week, you might want to consider two chapters that are in the Old Testament. 
1 Samuel chapter 24 and 25. It, because in 1 Samuel 24, David demonstrated great forbearance when dealing with King Saul, who, who wanted his life. He wanted to take away David's life from him. And David could have taken his life, but David wouldn't take the life of the Lord's anointed. I mean, David could have killed Saul, but he knew not to do that. But then in 1 Samuel 25, here David needs to learn some forbearance. Because in that particular chapter, it's Abigail who pleads for her evil husband. And David is ready to take Abel's life. And Abigail demonstrates great forbearance. Study those two chapters and you will see the contrast in David. One where he shows forbearance. Another where he needs to be more forbearing. But forbearance is that which brings us to the point where we can pray for our enemies. In Matthew 5 and verse 44, Jesus speaks of our loving and our enemies and praying for them. And that's tough, isn't it, sometimes? Because when we think about love, we think about mutual affection, don't we? A mutual affection. I can look around this room this morning and, and I, can, I can know that I love you. I can, I can start with just my own family. I can look over here and see the Benellis. I can see the Georges and I can see the Harrises. And I can just go off and name in all the names. Because that's what's important. That's the kind of love that's mutual affection. Praying for our enemies, that's different. That's different though, isn't it? Because it's not mutual affection. Somebody has said that that's moral understanding. It's not mutual affection, it's moral understanding. Pray for my enemies, love them because I have an idea that I know what sin can do to people. We, can, what, we understand why people do certain things. We understand why they behave in a certain way, even if it's against us because in this sin-sick world in which we live, that's what brings people to that, that point in life. And we have to be able to forbear that. And therefore, once I can understand, I can have a forbearing, I can be a forbearing person. Not only love my enemies, but pray for them as well. Somebody has said, you know, if you can pray for your enemies everything else will just fall into place. And I believe that's right. But forbearance, it's an attribute of God. Romans 2 and verse 4, what we need from God more than anything else, we need his forbearance. Notice what he says. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And so God is one who doesn't give up easily. I'm thankful that God does not just give up very easily at all. Forbearing, it's hard to get God to turn his back on us. Why? Because he's filled with forbearance. Look in Matthew 17 and verse 17. And I want you to listen to the, to the words of Jesus here. And as we think about this, this word forbearance, here Jesus says, O faithless and perverse generation, how long will I shall be, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? What is he talking about? He's talking about his forbearance. How long will I be forbearing to you? That was something that he was demonstrating that very moment. At that very time. But the point is this. The forbearance. The long suffering of God. But oh it's amazing indeed. That none of us could be saved. Without it. Have you thought about that? If it wasn't for the forbearance of God. How could we be saved? You see. We are the sinners. We are the ones that had transgressed God's law. God had every right to strike every one of us dead at the point we sinned. 
But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Important. Paul was begging the brethren in 2 Corinthians 11 to show some forbearance toward him. He says in verse 1, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. Or in verse 4 of that text, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. He's asking the brethren, please be forbearing toward me. And then look at his admonition in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4, where Paul is commanding not only the church at Thessalonica, but all Christians to show forbearance. He says, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. He is saying, you are demonstrating great forbearance there. Forbearance, an attribute of God. It was demonstrated in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul demonstrated such and has admonished us to be forbearing as well. What does it mean? That you don't fold. That you hold on. That you bear up. Not only while being provoked, but until the propagation is over. Now we go back to Ephesians chapter 4, if you will. It really is the summation of the humility and the meekness and the patience. Really, if a person is not humble and meek and filled with patience, they will have a hard time putting into practice the spirit of forbearance. It's going to be really tough for them to do that. But what is Christianity? There are lots of good definitions that come into our meaning of what is Christianity. But I like this. Letting Christ be who he is in and through our lives. That's Christianity. Letting Jesus be who he is in and through our lives. Now, what do you know about Jesus? He's forbearing until it's over. Now that helps me through life. Somebody who lives a life that is indifferent toward the Lord year after year after year after year, but at any time he desires, he can turn that around, can't he? That's right. That's forbearance. Well, maybe the Lord will love me for just a little while, but then he will give up on me. No, he's forbearing. He doesn't give up on anyone. Forbearing. He puts up until it's over. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. And now what does he say? He goes, I want you to be that way. He's our great example, isn't he? He wants us to be as forbearing as he is forbearing. Loving other people despite what they do. That's what that looks like. But isn't that the look that Jesus gave to Peter after Peter denied him? You see, it wasn't the look of, I give up on you. No, it was a look of, I'm not giving up on you. It was a look that Peter wouldn't forget. It filled Peter with a lot of pain. Peter might have even cried because he knew the Lord had not given up on him. And for whom did Jesus ask once that he was risen from the dead in Mark 16, 7? (laughs) He asked for Peter, didn't he? That's right. He asked for Peter, and that's the forbearance of Jesus the Christ. It was Jesus on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. It's what Stephen crying out when he said, Lord, lay not this sin upon their charge. Acts 7, 60. That's forbearance. 
evenness of mind, a liberal allowance for the faults of others. Here in Ephesians 4, the the word is used in the present tense. That means it's calling for this to be a a present way of life, a, a lifestyle for you and me. It's in the middle voice, which means hold on till it's over. You you don't ever lose the spirit of forbearance. And so it is that forbearance allows us effectively to deal with the different personalities. It allows us to deal with different opinions. It allows us to deal with the different abilities and the temperament. It can handle irritations and disturbances and embarrassments. And the person who has learned to be forbearing is the person who knows how to disarm and diffuse a potentially disruptive situation. Have you ever been around a person like that? When maybe there was a strain in the relationship of people and you're uncomfortable in a particular setting, but there are just some people who know how to make everybody feel good and to smooth the relationship or the relationships. A spirit of forbearance that comes from the heart, my friends. That's a person who's working towards peace, even among brethren. Working toward peace. Forbearance. It's not an easy thing. Forbearance one another, Paul says, in love. Forbearing one another and the spirit of the motivation is love. Oh, if it was a different time and we did not have to be six feet apart because of this virus. I mean, think about it. What is it that we miss the most of being together for worship? Is to be able to shake hands, to be able to touch elbows or, or just to be able to say hi and to see your f- smiling face on the other side of that cloth or that paper filter or whatever you want to call it. To be able to hug each other and to say we love each other and that we care for each other. And to be able to talk about that person and to be able to to find out what their needs are. To be able to greet our visitors and to be able to say we're so thankful that you've come. And it's not muffled and sound like Charlie Brown's teacher. Right? that's, That's the closeness, the knit closeness that we want to be able to have Again, that's, that's the wonderful part to be able to stand around and be able to talk to our brothers and sisters. To talk to potential people who might be up for a Bible study to learn more about Jesus in this church. Or maybe to be restored back to that first love. Forbearance is a beautiful, beautiful word. And Jesus himself said that when you talk about church growth, that love and unity is the key. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul even talked about this unity that we should have. That we all speak the same thing and that we be, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Forbearance is that which comes to mind, isn't it? Listen to Philippians 4 and verse 5. He says, let your moderation be known unto all men. What is another word for moderation? Forbearance. Let your forbearance be known unto all men. Self-giving sacrifice, which is the opposite of a self-centered, contentious spirit. It is a willingness to yield to other people. It is a refusal to retaliate when under attack. It is not easy, but that's the part of forbearance. Notice he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. And that brings us to our present day problem, and that's the problem of bullying. 
Yes, bullying is a problem. Our children are experiencing it out there in the schools. There are bullies that are out there even as for us as adults, bullies in the workplace. There are even bullies in the church. We are seeing a lot of bullying and abuse that's going on today with regards to our police. There are some who will bully other people over issues affecting us today and will affect our future as well. The liberal media will bully conservative people on what, what is right and what is, what is truthful. Frank Peretti knew something about bullying. You see, Frank Peretti wrote a book entitled The Wounded Spirit. He had been bullied as a boy because he had a lot of physical deformities. Young people and old alike can be very harsh toward others. But Peretti penned about his personal journey through pain and disfigurement and abuse, offering hope for those who were struggling with the emotional wounds. And here's what he wrote. He said, bullying and abuse betray a lack or a loss of respect for other human beings. There is a deeper issue. The devaluing of human life, and that in turn indicates a lack or a loss of respect for the giver of human life and dignity, God himself. The message of bully sins is a mockery of God's handiwork. A lie that slanders God's nature and negates his love for us. Page 84 of his book. Then I think about James 3 and verse 9. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith we curse. Therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. My friends, here's what forbearance says. Forbearance says, I'm going to give people room to grow. The person who is not willing to do that, number one, that person has an inflated view of himself and he has a bad memory. Because that person has forgotten that he needed people to be forbearing with him in times past. When we have a sober view of ourselves, it'll help us more quickly to put up with the immaturity of others and the differences of opinion among us and frustrations that we find. You know, when I reach a point of maturity where I can have a forbearing kind of love, that's what Jesus wants. I won't get upset when the waitress with the waitress when my order comes up wrong. I, I, I won't sound my horn when the person in front of me doesn't move fast enough when the light turns green. You might not want to do that here in Clearwater. Somebody's running a red light. And in the church of my Lord, I'll be more understanding of people and I will come to this understanding that when I think I am right about something other people think they're right too. Forbearance allows us to live together with understanding and in patience and in peace. You're looking at somebody who needed forbearance early in life. I'm thankful for those who were forbearing to me in my life. I'm thankful for the teachers, the instructors who exercised the same toward me. Elders in the church who demonstrated that toward me. I think it's something all of us need when it comes from the Spirit of Christ Jesus. Go with me to Matthew chapter 12 just quickly for just a moment. Matthew chapter 12. In this particular text, we read how in verse 14 that the Pharisees went out and they held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all and charged them that they should not make him known. He did this, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, behold, my servant whom I have chosen, behold, My beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive 
nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Now listen to verse 20. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. I like this translation of the verse, he will not crush those who are weak, and he will not quench the smallest hope. That sums it all up, doesn't it? That's Jesus. Somebody who is weak, who's undergoing hardship, he will not crush that person. He doesn't do that. Nor will he take away what that person needs more than anything else. And that's that person's hope. And we can't do that to people either. Don't crush the weak. Don't take away hope. Forbearing people you see are kind. And what does kindness do? <laughs> yeah, Kindness opens up. Whereas harshness will shut somebody up. Or it will cause one to retaliate or fight back. Neither of which is good. Kindness, which is demonstrated through forbearance, opens people up. It's, it's heartwarming. It brings people into your circle. It, it diffuses a volatile situation. I'm thankful for forbearance. And the forbearing person you see is secure in his relationship to Christ. He doesn't view every encounter as a contest. In years past, I can say that that's been a problem for me. I've always thought that I had to have the last word. But you see, the person who is secure in his relationship with Christ doesn't have to think that way anymore. Let's look at another passage, if we will, and then the sermon will be yours. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. And let's notice here's something that's very interesting to me. In 2 Timothy 2, and verse 23, he says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. Now, if you read First and Second Timothy and Titus, the preacher, particularly, he has warned us over and over again what to preach. We are to preach sound doctrine, and elders are warned to defend sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? That's healthy teaching, right? Healthy teaching. All of us are for sound doctrine, and we stand behind that kind of preaching. Yes, indeed. Look here in verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. You know, there are just some things that are not of a part of a healthy teaching. They're petty issues. Petty issues that oftentimes cause problems with the brethren. Now, we need to understand something. If we don't know the word, we will fight like the world. Did you know that? If we don't know the word... We will fight like the world. And most church arguments that arise come about because of ignorance. It's true. Worry about doctrine, not the pettiness. Help us, Paul. Verse 24, notice he says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience or patience. Patient when wrong. That's forbearance, isn't it? What does Paul say? Forbearing one another in love. In Colossians 3 and verse 13, a companion book, it says, forbearing one another in love. Must have been important, huh? Must have been. Let's have that same kind of attitude. Let's have that spirit of forbearance. Because we know that there's a God in heaven. And he has demonstrated great forbearance toward us. This morning, think about your relationship to, to God and his son, Jesus Christ. Is it right? The very fact that you're here today is because of the forbearance of God. It's very important that you have a right relationship with the Lord. Jesus died on that cross and shed his blood for a specific purpose and that's so that you could go to heaven he took your place a vicarious death 
taking one another's place. He took my place. He took your place. We hope that you'll make that difference even this morning. You might be a child of God and you've wandered away. Come back to that first love. Repent of those sins. Pray that God will forgive you and we'll pray with you and for you as well. You just need to let it be known.